Channel titled Supporting KSA Companies with their capital raising ambitions on the London Stock Exchange. Please allow me to introduce the moderator, Ms. Zahra Malik, the co founder and CEO of Grov Grovner Capital. Ms. Zahra Malik has substantial experience working in emerging and frontier markets. She has also worked on key philanthropy and impact campaigns with His Royal Highness King, King Charles. Most recently, Zahra has also contributed to Ford, Forbes Middle East, Arabian Business, and Entrepreneur Magazine for thought leadership pieces on impact investing and received an Impact Investing Entrepreneur Award in 2009. Everyone for Ms. Zahra Malik. Oh, thank you so much. A very beautiful welcome. Thank you so much for the very, very beautiful welcome. Um, a huge honor to be here. Basel, Wadad, the whole team, it's wonderful to see you and Rani as well. What, a, what an absolute honor. Um, so a big topic that we're covering at the, towards the end of the day. Um, and perhaps if I actually ask my panelists to just do a quick introduction, and then we'll go right into the questions. So over to you, Federica. Hello, so I'm Federica. I'm part of the LSE. I work within the fixed income team. and. I mainly support issuers coming to raise international capital on our markets. Um, I mainly work with everything that is east of the world, so focusing a lot on emerging markets, but I've worked a lot with Asia, uh, Middle East, and uh, Latin America. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tom Hinton. Um, I work very closely with Fedi and Abby. Um, I think maybe it's just very quickly worth um, contextualizing the LSE now that we're a, a big group. So. Um, think of London Stock Exchange Group as three parts. Um, one is data and analytics, the other one's clearing, and, and the third is capital markets. So all of us sit within capital markets and part of the business called primary markets, which essentially looks after all of our companies that raise capital on our markets, either companies coming to market or companies um, on our market already, and that's across debt and equity. Um, I, I run a part of the business called Issuer Services, um, and that's responsible for looking after the companies that are currently on our markets, both um, across equity and debt. And I run a team um, of uh, business people and developers that run a digital platform, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, name is Abby. Like I know that this is a predominantly LSE uh, panel. We'll try not to do too much selling. <laughs> Um, my name is Abby Ajayi. I look after uh, the Middle East and Africa primary markets business, which means essentially I'm trust with the responsibility of driving new listings, developing linkages across the markets that make sense for us um, in the region, uh, in the GCC, and of course also helping to governize existing conversations with listed companies in the region. Um, as my CEO says that listing is not just for Christmas. It's for the subsequent capital raising that you need to do to support your sort of strategic objectives. So I'll be very happy to be here today. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. I guess um, to give a bit of context, this time last year, we had a, a session with Tom Attenborough really discussing um, and highlighting dual listings. But before we go into that and before we kind of have almost a review as to sort of where we are 12 months on, um, Abby, if I actually start with you and, and perhaps... As you said, we don't want to sell the LSE too much. Um, this, is not, this is not a pitch for the LSE. However, um, it would be great if you could set the tone of the panel, give an insight as to why London and sort of some of the insights that you've had um, as an exchange would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think it's very important to put it into context. I mean, I'm so fortunate to be here in the morning to listen to the various panels and listen to people present. And also being a keen follower of the region, it is clear that there is a, it's a mood shift in terms of the strength and quality of capital in the region. There's a big uh, vision 2030 that is not just a plan, but it's actually um, quickly accelerating and driving not just capital, it's also driving knowledge as well as focus into the region. Um, it, when you last that week with, with Tom, I mean, I, I don't think that uh, you would have been opportune to talk about the number of IPOs that took place in 2022 alone. So more than 21 IPOs raising significant amount of capital. And let's not even talk about the very, very sort of the, the, the big elephant, which is the Saudi Aramco, which is listed in, on, on Tadawa. Um, we've come to see uh, a lot more investments coming in. Um, there's big ambitions, and th those ambitions are not just what's they've been followed with actions. 
um, with respect to the number of companies coming onto the exchange, it's become clear that what uh, the, the kingdom is looking for is looking for a partner and a partner, not just a partner looking on one way, you're looking to build what you call a partnership for prosperity. And in order for you to be a part of that, you need to be bringing something to the table that is actually quite symbiotic. Um, one, one thing, and uh, it's a good thing when, when, when Basel was saying, look, expanding a few, the future city Riyadh, uh, part of the vision 2030 is to expand, uh, to increase population from 15 to what, 30 million, uh, if that's the number in Riyadh, by 2030. Uh, and surprisingly, I was chatting to one of my um, business schoolmates and he said, look, I don't know what happened, but between 2020 and 2021, we have one million people added to the, to the population in Riyadh. So it's very difficult to get around. There's a lot of people in there. And just being in there, you can almost feel that something is happening. What this means with the expansion in population means that there would be pressure on infrastructure, uh, which means, I mean, and of course, you've seen what they've done on transport. The pressure on infrastructure, there will be pressure on a number of things, which means that needs to drive FDI into the region. Um, this attendant sort of um, strategy means that, one, there needs to be a coordinated, and, and of course, it is coordinated because the, the Strategic Management uh, Council is being led by right from the top and giving direction of how things are traveling. Um, means when you think about, look at NEOM in terms of what, what uh, the kingdom is trying to do, it means you, you should expect over the next five to 10 years more than $200 billion in infrastructure spend. Um, the region not only just being the, at the center of the GCC and driving the, the, the uh, um, what is uh, investment decisions in, in the region, it's also a big consumer of CAPEX. So for businesses that are there, there's the intention, one, to serve Saudi, but there's also an opportunity for them to also be global players. Everyone here, by the time you pick up a paper, you can read today that either the PIF has done an acquisition somewhere or is sponsored an acquisition somewhere. So it's doing both international and also doing locally. So when I sit at the table and I'm thinking, how can we be helpful? to drive that conversation when you're saying, you know, look, I'm not necessarily yet selling companies that are already inside it, say, come and list in London. No, I'm telling you that in addition to being part of that national agenda, that we want to be partners for you to start to think, hey, I want to expand internationally. Also, we also want to grow locally. There is opportunity for you to um, look at London. Uh, it's got, what, 6,000 unique investors. We're the most international exchange bar none, uh, and 65% of the investors that sit on the exchange are all international. 40% uh, of the companies that are listed on the exchange are all international without operations here. So there is uh, ample opportunity for companies already in Saudi to look at London, and I'll talk to you in, in, in greater detail at some point in time well, well, during this panel about what Ali, um, Dow Global has done with respect to one, uh, carving out what is this international business, putting it on an exchange here, and hopefully would use that as a platform to leapfrog into other markets in, in the very near future. So I, I would close it and maybe pause there and tell you, like, you know what, London is open and we are here singing a tune as a partner for progress in the region. Toby, thank you so much. You've given us a lot. To, to carry the conversation with. Um, and thank you also for touching on Dar Global. It was actually going to be a question for later, but it's really good to sort of set that narrative because, again, um, quite a significant project. So appreciate that. Um, Federico, I'm actually going to come over to you. So now that Abby's set a really interesting scene about London being ready and open and has always been, I mean, there's a huge heritage with the Kingdom and the United Kingdom in terms of relationship. But one of the questions, and again, not too sales, but, but why is the LSC sort of slightly different from other indexes and other, other exchanges? And, and what is it that sort of differentiates you to, to other ones? Yeah, so taking a bit from what both Tom and Abby have mentioned. So Abby mentioned, of course, the incredible diversification of our investor base. And Tom was explaining how much LSE has changed over the past few years, how much we've grown. We're just, not just a listing venue. We have um, data. We have um, platforms. We have post-trade. We have so many different spaces that we've tried to put all of this together and really sell ourselves as partners throughout the entire capital raising process. So 
for example, in debt, how we support issuers is other exchange might just be places for a technical listing, which is what investors need. You need to have your uh, bond listed somewhere for your investors to be happy about it. Great. We want to be a bit more than that. We want to be able to support you before your capital raising. Uh, we've been doing that through uh, Spark Live, which is one of our platforms that supports virtual uh, roadshows and um, additional uh, interactions, GICs, with, um, with investors. And we do that, of course, with uh, the broadening of our markets. So we have our main markets. We have a full international securities market, which is really uh, focused into international issuers who might need a bit of a closer support mm -hmm. from uh, from the exchange incoming to market. Um, and it allows them to not interface with a third party. Um, and even after the listing, um, a lot of what uh, Tom teams down around uh, issuer services is once you're part of the LSE, you're part of a very large ecosystem that allows you to interface yourself with ESG data that's coming through Refinitiv. It allows you to get access to um, uh, to news sources, aftermarket research, um, but even just engaging with us, coming to the exchange, having your meetings with investors or with uh, um, or doing any kind of presentations within the exchange. So it allows you to uh, have an ongoing conversation, mm -hmm. see how the companies are growing, um, ensure understanding all the steps of their capital raising process and, uh, and uh, never having a stop in between. So it allows you to keep an ongoing conversation and really grow yourself with the uh, companies as well. So, uh, so, so what we've seen is issuers get a lot of benefits from it and uh, a lot of issuers have started coming from other exchange to the LSE. And for example, in the Middle East, uh, we've seen in the past five years an incredible market share growth. We've gone to from around 15% market share of international bonds up to 70% of um, bonds coming, international bonds coming from the Middle East. Uh, and this is because of everything else that is um, in addition to the capital raising. Capital raising is fundamental, um, but you want to have a diverse base for that. And we've always offered it, but now even more. But you want to have everything else um, as well. And that, I think, Tom, yeah, sort of yeah, beyond gonna... the exchange. It's always yeah, sort of beyond yeah. the exchange, really. It's a sort of full vehicle yeah. exactly. that you've now developed. So Tom, uh, actually, yeah, I was going to say. I mean, I think the fascinating thing about working in international markets and companies is all the companies struggle or with the same thing, regardless of sector, regardless where they're from. Yeah. You know, how do you tell your story to an international or a domestic investor base? How do you connect with them? What's the best platform to go on? And I think you know, my background is ECM, so I worked at Citigroup and have done you know multiple IPOs, you know, a bit like Abby and. I never appreciated before I joined the LSE the reach that we had, you know, and if, if you look at, and again, try not to be too salesy, but I'm sure you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll forgive me given where we're sitting. Um, when I first joined here, I remember sitting in this theatre with um, leaders, you know, prime ministers and presidents of countries presenting to investors. And I, and I thought, wow, this is, you know, powerful, That's right? Not, not, it is remarkable. And our convening power is, I, I would say, unique you know, certainly, certainly in Europe. Um, so the, the exam question for us when we started building issuer services, which is our digital platform, was how do we give this benefit to our issuers? So that, that could be issuers in, in the UK, it could be international issuers. And actually we're, we're agnostic as to the, the listing location, as to who uses our, our infrastructure. So the way I like to think about it is we offer a financial digital infrastructure or financial infrastructure where companies list. But on top of that, as Fedi was saying, we, we offer a digital infrastructure. And that means actually using our distribution platforms through the 400,000 or 500,000 desktops that we sell to um, institution and buy side. It means using the, I think it's 60 million unique visitors we have coming to our website every single year that are investors that look at companies list on our exchange and giving our companies or our or, or sovereigns or you know, bond issuers access to those pages so that they can tell their story in an authentic manner across a distribution platform which is unrivaled globally. Mm. And, you know, for us, that's really important because, you know, I remember, you know, 
looking at when we were trying when I was at City trying to do IPOs and thinking, you know, where do we get the demand from? How do we dip into it? And actually, what what we what we're able to do is be a neutral, open access venue, which is global, which allows every single participant to access that, and allows crucially the most important client to us, which is our issuers, to tell their story across all of our platforms. So that's you know that's a really really critical role that I think we're developing and that we now now play, which we didn't play previously. No, thank you so much, and thank you to actually again not only set the scene for London but to explain sort of beyond the exchange the, the platform that you've actually developed in the last few years particularly and if I could actually now put a spotlight onto the kingdom and some of the work that you've done directly um, beyond the elephant in the room with the uh, Aramco uh, listing which I know we, we discussed previously but um, it would be so great for the audience to understand perhaps some tangible case studies um, not just a sort of major um, companies that you've aligned with, but even sort of the SME narrative, because we appreciate that the SME community in Riyadh particularly are sort of around 52% are they sort of making and uh, really, really contributing to the GDP. So how do we kind of not only look at the PIFs, but also look at sort of the SME communities and where, where would the LSE uh, place itself in that dialogue? Just, I mean, so to, to whoever me, really. Me, I, I think... <laughs> What you call SMEs are not really not really SMEs, SMEs yes, because agreed, yes. Um, the in the region the significant part of the GDP is constituted in the what you call family offices yes, or exactly. family-owned businesses, and it's maybe a, if you let me use that as a way to call them SMEs, and what you find is as part of the Vision 2030 strategy is to one increase private sector contribution from I think it's growing around 40% now to about 65% by 20, 2030, which means significant amount of diversification expected in the region. And with all of the infrastructure plans and then the uh, big spend taking place today, it means that one, um, you'd find some of those SMEs, family owned business becoming institutionalized and approaching the tidal wall and, and listing accordingly. One, one big opportunity, and, and, and I, I think maybe I, I spoke I spoke about uh, Da um, earlier. I would also talk about the two companies which we were speaking to just in the, in the past week. And then they spent what? Um, they've exited two companies on the title, and they continue to see big market opportunities in the region. They want to keep focusing on that, but at the same time, they want to leverage the track record and understanding of the sector they've been playing, particularly around infrastructure, want to travel with that. The family-owned businesses don't have any intention of listing the family business in itself, but they want to be able to list vehicles across and be able to exit portfolios. At the same time, we want to um, one, preserve the capital they have to finance infrastructure and finance the projects they have in the region, but also want to travel and expand globally. So one of the things that they can talk to us is a what, what are your thoughts about one listing a vehicle here in London, mm -hmm. providing a bit of seed capital, and using the currency from that to acquire additional assets globally? And I so said, you know, like, there's no better market to help you do that because, one, this is a market that has good research following, good understanding of international stories. As I mentioned to you, 40% all of the companies, 2,000 of the companies that are listed here, are completely international, have no operations in the UK. Mm -hmm. And so we are, there is that understanding. And also the fact that there is 65% I mentioned earlier of the investors that are in, that are in London are international. Mm -hmm. So that helps in terms of help you propagate and allows you to tap a, a unique pool differentiated from what you have in there. So um, I do know, and I say this without uh, categorically, that in addition to the GCC ambitions of, of, of Saudi, it also has global ambitions, which it's highlighted in 2030 and of course Vision 2050, which is which is coming in, and they're already all sort of working on that. And this sort of helps to, um, this plan helps to to, to, to follow that ambition, mm -hmm. particularly with the uh, with the SMEs. Earlier, I don't think you were here, there was a supermarket uh, um, family-owned business, which was one of the first that listed on, on Tato, and it was talking about what the listing did, did for the business in terms of institutionalizing the business and putting a structure in. That is the business that is working where they understand it. There's a unique opportunity, again, to export that know-how and capital to a new market. This is how London helps it. Helps it. And in addition, for businesses that are listed on the exchange uh, where there is significant capital, domestic knowledge uh, on there to, to support them, 
there is the London presents an opportunity through GDRs, which is a part that we've worked with Tata World to develop for them to raise capital internationally and also sort of develop a unique currency, as I mentioned, a cushion currency to help them acquire new assets without necessarily uh, uh, and allow their brand to travel beyond beyond the region. Mm. So. That's really helpful. Mm. Um, Tom, did you? Ha I know that there was also some yeah, on was, the case study piece. That I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone you wanted to talk yeah, about sure. PIF at all, but before we, I mean, we supported PIF, and I know that's we can't yeah. say that's an SME. No, um, of course my, not. My, not my, right knowledge right. my knowledge extends <laughs> that far, but um, the I think the benefit of having done that. Um, for their capital raises, it raises the profile of the broader, you know, story, which, which has a trickle down effect. We've seen that in other markets where you, you know, raise the profile, and then that helps, you know, the broader economy to raise their profile across international investors. So I think that is helpful. I think on a, as a broader point, what we've done with our technology is to, and I mentioned it earlier, is to be agnostic as to ge geography, but we've also been agnostic as to size, because mm -hmm. you know, if you think about the history of the LSE and not, you know. Sort of going too back to the history, but 300 years ago, we launched in a coffee shop down the road in Change Alley, right, where people were pinning notes on the walls of the prices of security. And that, you know, and that actually, in a funny way, that muscle memory and that heritage throughout our history has always been around small businesses. And again, recognizing that SMEs mean different things yes, to different people. Absolutely. But therefore, our technology needs to reflect that heritage and needs to reflect that philosophy that actually we can't just look at. You know, regardless of location, we can't just look at large caps or sovereigns. We need to make sure that our technology works for smaller companies that are raising finance across what we call the funding continuum. Mm -hmm. So that comes from startups through to family businesses, through to scale ups, you know, all the way up to, you know, large caps and sovereigns and everything else. So I think, you know, I guess that's the spirit within which we've, we've built our technology. So I think it, it you know, it feeds through to, to the kingdom as well. Again, it's that whole sort of full yeah. vehicle and cycle that you've created that the men can be a, a true support mechanism and partner for the kingdom, which is obviously what makes it quite relevant. And Fred Federico, if I could ask you to also expand on that sort of, especially yeah. the, the PIF narrative. Yeah, no, of course. And I think what we did with PIF is extremely replicable, of, as Tom said, throughout sizes, throughout countries, uh, because what we did was support them in everything that was of course before the listing so um it was a green bond it was a first time coming to market with uh, with a green bond of so di such different sizes and tenors we went from 10 to 100 years so it was such a, an incredible span of uh, tenors of projects backing um that uh, we were able to provide them with a space where they could really showcase what their projects what the projects they were backing were um, and really showing their own words why the investors would uh, would need to invest in some mm -hmm. in this kind of security which for PIF gathering that kind of support is of course something that they can do in different ways this was just one way to gather them all in one place mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's especially relevant for SMEs, for smaller companies that might not have that kind of same um, connections with, uh, with investor base, that might not have that same kind of relevance in the market or that pull that, uh, that PIF could have, mm -hmm. but that still deserve to have that space uh, to really uh, show uh, why the capital is being raised, mm -hmm. to have that space to, to ask for feedback, to gather intel from their investors of what they want to see. Um, and I find it even more relevant when it's connected to sustainable finance because it really allows um, the conversation to dig deeper, to uh, make sure that even for, straight on from the beginning, we are not risking any kind of greenwashing, mm -hmm. that the projects are solid, that the green social or sustainable narrative within the bond is makes viable. sense it's viable yeah. is there Absolutely. and uh, um and really understand anything that the investors want to to know uh, investors are getting more and more um specific and sophisticated around these these instruments so there needs to be a space where they can um, approach with the uh, with the securities before com them coming to market. Well, absolute music to my ears because, of course, being in the uh, impact, being in the forefront of what I do, I think it's reassuring that there are these sort of mechanisms being put in place. And before I pester you a bit more about that and we get a bit deeper, I just wondered if um, the audience wanted to ask any questions at this stage. <coughs> Ali. Um, <coughs> 
Yeah. I'll go ahead and ask. Um, Federico was mentioning uh, the, the increase in bond issues from uh, from our part of the world. Um, and earlier um, in the presentations this morning, uh, we saw in the presentation a reference to um, the LSE providing a facility for non-listed companies to come once a year and and uh, auction their bonds, uh, uh, you know, private companies that have not gone uh, public yet. Uh, would this kind of facility be offered in the Middle East uh, to so qualified companies right. or? Uh, yeah, so private companies. This is the flow uh, flow project. project. Is that so? Is I, so I, I think I think. Mm. Yeah. Tom and earlier in this presentation talked about yeah. our focus on what you call the funding continuum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're developing what is the, the world's first crossover market. And and right in the mid, so it was the first time in terms of following companies through their um, investment cycle from private. And then, then, of course, we got the public market. And right in the middle, the companies that decide that, uh, look, maybe we want to become public, we're not sure yet, but to providing them what you call training wheels to see if, being a public company is something that is for them. One, giving them a platform, as I said, on an intermittent basis to um, sell down, to be a secondary only platform, to sell down the securities and also expose uh, the, sh the stories to new investors, start to curate investors early, and use it as a platform to incentivize and attract the best talents, because then some of these companies you see would give uh, the employees stock options where they get dividends at the end of the year, but also the opportunity for them to monetize that through that intermittent basis. At the moment, we are uh, talking actively to the regulators and we expect to be in a regulatory sandbox at Q1 uh, next year and hopefully by sometime, after, sometime next year to have this to, to start. It's the first crossover market and I think, you know what, in our international nature, it's, it's expectation that this will be available to all of the companies that, that, of course, come to London. I think our, as we say, our raison d'etre is around three Cs, which is capital for those users and providers and the communities that are around it and the ecosystem around it. And then, of course, the conversations that facilitate good governance, best practices and are inspiring. Uh, companies not just to make money but to do good in, in the process. So, of course, uh, I, I won't make the promise, but then it, it's a work in progress, and by the time we launch next year, hopefully we'll have more opportunities to, to, to develop the dialogue. Yeah, and this, this could provide uh, better yielding bonds uh, mm -hmm. uh, from pretty high, uh, uh, high quality uh, uh, companies. Yeah. I think it's a good opportunity. Yeah, and what I can add on uh, private companies coming to market, we're of course very happy for private companies to issue bonds. Uh, we don't have a limit on size, so it, a bond on our markets can be as small as 200,000 pounds. So there is no limit in size, no limit in currency. Um, we have ISM, as I was mentioning, which allows you to not even have to interface with the FCA and just work with a regula um, London Stock Exchange regulated market, which a lot of private companies might prefer just because it's easier. It allows you to use local law, local GAP, so just allows you to have a faster and easier way into, um, into international capital markets. Uh, we have seen some uh, private company, uh, several private companies come, raise capital in either a hard currency or local currency. So we're extremely open to that. And what we're also doing is working with a few um, external platforms like so Treasury Spring, Primary Bid, that allows uh, issuers to, um, to also ask for working capital short-term paper that that also could be uh, another way for um, for these kind of companies to get access to smaller denominated uh, bonds thank you so much I think there was what I think Basil's Basil got a question if we could get a microphone over this is meant to be the the mid-panel Q&A but also just conscious of time because I know that Tom also needs to Abby what kind of answer would you give people who would tell you they were listing, A, expensive, secondly, it will uh, expose them more to another jurisdiction. That's my first question. Second question, does 
do a listing apply to the A market as well? So the more market from our side can do a list on AIM. Thirdly, what percentage of your listed companies are dual listed somewhere else? And would you consider the Dowell, our own stock exchange, to be the recipient of UK companies? Okay. I think I got the three questions. And I, I, I got the three questions that I'm going to. I'm going to try to address them. I, th I think that, um, I'm referring again to the to the first. I think it was Bin Dawood, uh, the gentleman who from the family. So he, he pointed at something, which is when people say like. Why are you listing? And when people are coming to the public markets, you must have a clearly defined rationale for, for listing. Um, is it for liquidity purposes? Do you want to achieve uh, institutionalization of the business? And also to ensure that you have a legacy in place. So once you've achieved listing, the, the cost element needs to, one, it's of course cost benefit. So if you do a listing into, into London, it's because one, you have significant market recognition in your local market. You want to tap an additional investor base that would give you um, one quantum leap you into one new market because, of course, London has status, prestige. We're 300 year old fintech. So, <laughs> there's recognition of the fact in terms of the rules of the road, the governance structure, and the framework. One is very friendly, and you can rest assured that, you know, from a market behavior and and then and uh, uh, um, participation point of view that this is the market where you you want to be on it from an international point of view so i would not look at it from a cost on that cost basis you need to think about the opportunities that come with it in order for you to do that that's just one so as companies one of the things which we do uh, we we have the main market which is the one this is lse and we've got aim and the aim one gives companies as little as market cap of what one million to two million dollars can come on that and we've got significant support infrastructure to support those companies growth companies all the way to over a billion dollars i think some of those companies have even moved and some have stayed some of them have moved to the main market to come onto a and then of course we've got the main market where we've seen companies from 20 million dollars all the way to what uh, five over five or six or seven eight more than one more say several billions of dollars listed on, on, on the main market you can either come in with odds uh, where we have full fungibility and connectivity and we're trying to develop that across markets, particularly in, in, in MIA where I mean, I've just recently joined over the last four months and one of my, my, my big trusts is to make sure that the markets that are important and strategic like this, that we have full linkages and fungibility across this market. At the moment with Tata Wu, we've developed and worked with them to develop certain sort of companies that are already listed in exchange come here through GDRs and, 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 and list here. Um, I do think whether we like it or not, we're, any, we're a data market infrastructure company. And I dare say that we're the largest in the world um, in, in, in what we do, and just given our, the, the value of, of what, we, what we offer. At some point in time, we'll, we would have to see true connectivity across all those markets. Blockchain is coming, there'll be full connectivity at some point in tokenization. And so if we don't build the infrastructure, technology would overtake us on. I think that this is something that it would happen whether we like it or not. So that's the second question. I think the third question which you asked me, I've forgotten. And this is, I don't know if I've answered it. No, I don't think I've answered the third question. Yeah. What percent? What, how would you, oh, yes. Yeah. So I, I think I mentioned the four, uh, about 40 odd percent of the companies that are listed in London are international. Uh, uh, and I also have a door <laughs> listing somewhere else. So when I said they're international, about just under 40, maybe 35% or so, I have a door listing um, somewhere else. So we are exactly, exactly what uh, uh, Tom mentioned, that uh, we're an open open market and we, we thrive on innovation and connectivity as much as possible. And that's what makes us uh, quite unique in our position. Thank you, Abby. I know you put on the hot seat there by Basil, so thank you so <laughs> much for that. Um, I am conscious of time, Tom, so um, I guess, just to sort of summarise as well, uh, what would be really interesting to, to hear from you, Tom? I know you mentioned that we discussed how London is, is open, but I do want to kind of bring back the sort of London narrative because, again, I think what's interesting is why is the exchange so important? And, what is, and the other question I also had was also how have investors' appetite perhaps changed in the last 
five years or so, particularly post-COVID, um, you know, I know that, Abby, you'd mentioned it actually on the call, but I know that it's probably been a theme throughout as well as the sort of inward reflection and inward um, importance of investment into the kingdom. What are some of the sort of perhaps investors' outlook on that? Um, and again, how do we create that sort of symbiotic relationship well, that you already have between London and the kingdom? And sort of some of your insights would be really great. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to touch on the initial sort of question around appetite. Um, I think if you look at our, you know, our collective experience over COVID and the, the way that the markets reacted to that, you know, in the UK and globally, I think what we proved, you know, what investors showed in the UK is that they're open to fund businesses regardless of the macro, you know, environment companies are listed, um, you know, in London would be that dual listing or, you know, sole listing. And I think that's why actually a lot of people, you know, look look to London and it and it I think we proved our resilience so over that period of time. And you know, I think it's easy to forget what it was like at the beginning moment, of that yeah, period, absolutely. right? Everyone was like, oh my God, is everything gonna fall apart? Um, but it didn't. Um, and um, and on the contrary, actually, you know, it, we thrived. And and I think obviously we've seen this this kind of lull in in IPOs, you know, globally, and actually London's broadly reflected. Um, uh, the you know the general um, global outlook. We've actually got two IPOs tomorrow um, <laughs> pricing. So yes. on the same on the same day, one both international. Yep. Um, so Abby can can talk to those, and I and I think that resilience, um, that openness, um, that kind of long longevity um, yes. serves you know the kingdom as it does international markets. You know, know very very well. I mean, Abby, you probably want to. Add, add some more. So, you know, so I, I think the other thing to, to say is like um, there is a flurry of companies in the region that are going on the exchange, which means at some point in time, there's, there's capital and there's liquidity uh, to support this these companies. And if you look at the exchange and the investors there, it's a very strong domestic following. Uh, most of them investing for capital preservation and for, for wealth preservation as well as following through and what for specific companies some companies are thinking okay how do i diversify my shareholder base how do i incentivize the companies that are listed to provide inventory um to to support trading uh, because that's also the other thing which london london sort of brings in terms of that that connection so that that's one two there is significant understanding of growth companies uh, on this market uh, and when i say growth and tech uh, tech companies uh, one of the key ambitions of the region is to build a very strong tech ecosystem and you see um, i think it was a panel before talking about tech and what they're trying to do around innovation hubs london uh, about 10 20 220 company 20 companies listed in london are uh, tech and tech enabled uh, uh, companies here so there is that no, not just know how there's also the investor following so the ability to tap that knowledge base as well as connectivity uh with with, with london so mm -hmm. having to do all these things for those companies will be particularly useful and that's that way we can support um i expect that with the government sponsored sort of listings that are taking place on a wave of family of the own businesses that will follow through at some point in time from a capacity point of view you would need to want to broaden out and, and connect. And you've seen what Tadawal has done in signing MOUs across with a number of exchanges, London included, as what well, that conversation is ongoing, to be able to ensure that, look, as the, uh, the pipeline is coming through, that there is always an option of, okay, Tadawal plus, mm -hmm. and Tadawal add. Mm -hmm. And depending on, in, depending on the company to give them full optionality to say, look, I'm coming on Tadawul, I'm a national champion, I've got recognition, but I also want to want spotlight myself in other markets to say, look, I'm doing this in, in, in Saudi, but I'm also able to do this elsewhere. So I, I think that that's a key consideration and that's something that you will see uh, sort of going forward. Thank you so much. And I think I'm just also going to sort of just take a few steps back because you mentioned, Abby, um, on the, the tech side and Rodrigo, you also started the conversation, and I'm just kind of close to my heart, but obviously I know both at a sovereign level, with ESG being a huge focus, right down to the SMEs, apologies, the family office space as well. Um, 
it'd be interesting because I know that the LSE is really trying to spearhead um, the issuing of green bonds and also the green to cook and sort of yeah. what's happening there. Um, so it'd be great to kind of get a spotlight on that before I probably have to close the panel and just ask for the last question. But I, I would love your insight for that. Yeah, no, of course. So sustainability is at the forefront of what we're doing at LSE and it has been for a few years. We've Literally last week, just won another award as um, the leading stock exchange in sustainable finance uh, for the third out of four years. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really at the core of everything that we've been doing. Um, we were the first exchange to have a green segment back in 2015. Uh, this has evolved in the sustainable bond market. Uh, we have a sustainable bond market advisory group, which has several uh, members of the market from advisors to issuers to consultants just to really um, meet up a few times a year and really understand what the market wants to see. Mm -hmm. So we've been the first exchange to have a transition segment for um, one of the first to have a sustainability link bond segment. So there is something for everyone within mm -hmm. the sustainable bond market. And we've seen an incredible growth of, uh, of bonds in, in the space. We've seen a lot of it grow in Sukuk's as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen the first sustainability Sukuk from the likes of Riyadh Bank. We've seen the first sustainability Sukuk from um, Saudi National Bank. We've seen um, two uh, green bonds from, two Sukuk green bonds from uh, Saudi Electricity that came uh, just a few months ago. So there is a lot happening in the space. Uh, we've been a uh, part of the uh, high-level working group on Green Sukuk since uh, last year. Um, we, we really think it's somewhere that can grow so much more. Uh, we think it aligns perfectly with Vision 2030. There's so many of the same key goals. Um, it can support so much of the infrastructure growth that uh, Abby was referring to earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and it really can allow uh, international... Uh, investors to come in for something that will really make a difference, uh, not just in the kingdom, but uh, globally. Uh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And uh, PIF was a great example of that. Yes. They came a couple of times already um, in the in the last few months. And I think, I always think when the likes of the sovereign or such closely aligned sovereign comes to market with this kind of bonds, it's really a, a huge push for the entire country. We've yes. seen it in a lot of um, of others' geographies as well. When it comes from the top, the corporates, the small SMEs will follow. Um, even if you, they don't need an incredible amount of capital in the green space, <coughs> but even just to position themselves as we want to be at least part of a little bit of this change. Oh, um, and I think it's it's incredible to see. I think it's something that will grow more and more and we're just here to help facilitate, help that, yeah. facilitate that in as many ways as possible. No, and, and that's hugely reassuring because I guess absolutely as you said if it's coming from the top down there is that sort of sense of well their investment is there and therefore it's something that we should consider as well and of yeah, course absolutely. it's sort of the fashionable term so to say the least in the in the market at the moment particularly uh, in the kingdom so it's great again to know that the LSE provides that vehicle and opportunity to, you know, not necessarily have to be at a PIF level, but also to know that there yeah, is that they all, you're kind of able to facilitate that and help private companies, family offices who are also trying to really get involved with the with the green bond space. Yeah. So um, hugely reassuring, and thank you for that. On the SBM, we've had bonds from ten billion pounds to five million dollars issued in. Kenyan shilling yeah, so the, well, the, the broadness of it is incredible mm. uh, most of the capital raised on sustainable bond market is international mm -hmm. uh, so just the diversity of it and the global the, the, willingness yes, yes the, yeah, the interest absolutely. from the entire world on it is is great to see thank you so much can I, can I just add one please, very please. small point um, I don't I don't think you mentioned it, the, the voluntary carbon market, which we've just launched as well, which is probably just worth people being aware of, which is a market that companies and investors can invest in, which is a reg essentially puts a regulated wrapper around projects which are um, which provide companies with carbon credits. So, you know, the carbon market is very opaque. Absolutely. Um, and this brings um, those projects within a fund structure which is regulated by the FCA. Mm -hmm. So companies can be comfortable that actually all the disclosure, all the diligence around the projects that underlie that are bona fide 
And rather than getting paid dividends, they get paid dividends in species which can go towards offsetting their carbon footprint. So it's called the Voluntary Carbon Market. We launched it um, earlier this year. Yeah, a few months Wait, ago. Again, it's yeah. another layer of almost kind of creating that credibility as well, which is, um, which is, re which is what companies need at this, at this stage with, with this sort of carbon dialogue um, really increasing. Um, I will just ask the audience one more time if there are any questions um, for the panel before we close. I have one question. Please. <coughs> I don't think I need a microphone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, in, in dealing with Tadawud, in Saudi Arabia, do you invite people who work in Tadao to come and get some experience? They're like a, an exchange of, and, and vice versa. So, sorry, I'll just take that because I, uh, there's been conversation historically, we've had that happen before, and I think there is another conversation which is in its uh, nascent stages. So we've got a draft which we're discussing around the the, the framework and how that would work so it's all encompassing to make sure that it's robust uh, because we don't only just um, what's the word we're not necessarily taking companies to come to London we're also very much driven to uh, ensure market development because then once you're able to build that um, the bridge and the framework is <coughs> both parts of the pond, pond will benefit from activity across across connected markets so it's it's in our interest one to ensure that on the other side that you know there's skill in terms of capacity capacity building and knowledge and market development uh, as it is here, here in london so putting both knowledge and capital to work uh, it's actually to our advantage so it's not necessarily that we're doing do you know my favor so but definitely that is something that it's uh it we're in, we're in discussion on yeah, I mean, if you have some Saudis that come and train here, they'll be your best ambassadors, right? Mm -hmm. it's best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great one there. Mm -hmm. um, so if I could just ask my panellists to just perhaps give uh, just a, a closing uh, sort of remark, perhaps, that you'd like the audience to go away with um, would be super helpful. <laughs> sort of just a, a quick takeaway, um, almost like a closing word would be great. Who's going to go first? Abby's going to go first. There we go. <laughs> well, I would close and say, like, L London is open. And you stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> London, London is so open. Is Riyadh. Riyadh is also very London open. is open, and, uh, and we're very driven to building a partnership for prosperity with the kingdom and one helping the, the, um, the kingdom implement it, its vision 2030 and beyond. And as much as possible, we'll be a credible partner um, going, going forward. Thank you. Um, I, I build on that and say partnership. You know, we're, we're super excited um, to be working with the kingdom. We want to be, uh, you know, a long-term partner. And, and we're passionate about, you know, helping the development of the market and helping um, the kingdom and all of its community to raise their profile and raise capital. And, and as Abby said, we're open. Thank yeah. you so much. And after you. to build on all of that, open partners and to touch on what I was mentioning before, really looking forward to doing something around the sustainable space. Uh, I think it's uh, it's where the future is, and we are doing everything that we can to help facilitate issuers raising that kind of capital. So so definitely somewhere to something to look into. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. It's been an absolute honour. And it wasn't too salesy at all, but I'm absolutely <laughs> convinced. Um, so thank you so very, very much. Um,